Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. Politics, wildlife, volcanoes, and the very first national river, they all showed up on nationalparkstraveler.org this past week. The Trump administration found itself before the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in California, arguing for the appellate court to overturn a lower court's ruling that blocked 63 miles of towering border wall from going up along the southern boundary of Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument in Arizona. Across the country in Arkansas, we learned that the state had decided to buy out an industrial hog farm operation that could potentially pollute the Buffalo National River. And from Hawaii, we heard that earthquakes have been shaking the Mauna Loa volcano at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. No eruption is said to be imminent, but after last year's eruptions from Kilauea Volcano, we'll be keeping an eye on Mauna Loa. In this week's show, I sat down with Brigham Young University professor Tom Smith, an associate professor of wildlife sciences and a member of the National Rifle Association, to discuss packing firearms into the backcountry of a national park in the name of protection from wildlife. You might be surprised to hear his thoughts. We also outline the wonders to be found along the volcanic legacy highway in the Northwest and end with a commentary on the future or the extinction of the national park idea in the United States. How best can you protect yourself against a bear attack when hiking or backpacking in the backcountry of the national park system? It's a question that comes up from time to time, particularly after there's been a mauling. More than a few comments are made that some won't go into the bear habitat unless they're packing a firearm. The National Park Service, however, urges backcountry travelers to carry bear spray. And in Yellowstone National Park, they'll even show you how to spray a charging bear. A bear made out of plywood, that is. To explore the issue of guns in the backcountry, we've invited Dr. Tom Smith, a Brigham Young University professor who long has studied this topic to join us. His research interests include wildlife-human conflicts, particularly involving all three species of North American bears. Welcome, Dr. Smith. Yeah, good morning. Now, as I mentioned, you long have studied bears and human interactions in uh, backcountry situations. And um, one thing I noticed in reading some of the papers that you've authored over the years is that 84% of handgun users and 76% of long gun or rifle users, shotguns, etc., are successful in defending themselves against a bear attack. Doesn't that indicate that firearms are, are great tools for defense against bears? Well, as long as you're not in that 24% overall, um, it's, it's a good thing. And obviously, firearms have and will continue to protect people. I think the key is that, and that's the point of the paper, is one should undergo some heavy introspection before they go into bear country as to whether or not they think they're going to be competent with a firearm under duress. So I'm not by any means anti-firearm. I just think that the vast majority of people would be better served by just using a non-lethal. And if you want to talk more about that, we can. Uh, The reasons why I think that's the case. but. I certainly don't rule them out. I've carried one many years myself. Yeah, I believe you, you've mentioned to me um, previously that uh, you're an NRA member as well as an instructor. That's correct. Yeah, I teach, oh, about 40 to 50 students a year at the university and the safe use of firearms. And the one th- interesting point you mentioned um, was that knowing how to aim and shoot a firearm is, is one thing, and knowing how to aim and, and shoot and keep your composure while being charged by a grizzly bear is totally something else. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I talk to people, and, and respectfully so, but they'll say, yeah, I, I, I own guns, and I, it's a hobby of mine. And I'll ask them how competent they are. And they say, well, down at the range, I, I can rank among the best. And that's all good. Uh, but, you know, protecting yourself against an aggressive bear would be quite a different experience than being at a shooting range. You could kind of imagine it would be a place where the targets come down off of the rack and they chase you around. And <laughs> if they catch you, you get mauled. So it's not exactly like standing with a gun rest, a bench rest. 
taking shots at a bullseye. And it's kind of hard to, to duplicate that uh, experience in a, in a shooting range. Well, it is. And in a recent paper I published looking at 135 years of bear human conflict in Alaska, over 700 cases, um, the one thing that stood out when you analyze those, the vast majority of instances, the person first is made aware of the bear's presence at any at about five meters or 15 feet, roughly. So that means, let's say, let's say you're a hunter, and most people, you know, hike to the place that they're going to hunt, right? They don't just get out of their, their um, you know, their vehicle or whatever and have the gun in a field-ready position with one in the chamber and the safety off. That's just not a safe thing to do. So they've got it over their shoulder, especially if they're hefting around some of these veritable cannons, you know, three Winchester, 300s, 375, 308s. 30 odd. I mean, these are big, heavy guns. So they got it over their shoulder. Now picture at 15 feet, all of a sudden you've rounded a bend, there's a grizzly and you've got to get that off your shoulder to your shoulder, you know, put one in the chamber safety. I mean, it's not going to happen. And that is very commonly what happens. So it's, it's not an ideal tool for close encounters and for that reason, I think we see a different set of statistics under uh, for the use and deployment of bear spray. It's been much more successful in defending people. Yeah, well, we'll get into that in a moment. In your studies and the, the research that you've uh, conducted and, and data that you've looked through, were you able to differentiate between hunters who were attacked and, and hikers or backpackers who were attacked? Well, it's an interesting kind of a question you ask because some of the uh, the studies that predated me, they just lumped them all as either what, you know, what were you doing? I was a hunter. I was a camper. I was, you know, I was a hiker. I was doing research or something. But the reason I'm explaining this is a hunter in a campsite walking, let's say down to take a look at an overlook. That's not a hunter. That's a hiker. And uh, similarly, a hunter that has uh, a gun over their shoulder trying to get to the place to, you know, to, to start their stock. That's not a hunter, that's a hiker. So when you break that out into what I call primary and secondary purpose for, you know, or uh, primary and secondary activity that they're in, you see that the vast majority of, of people involved in bear, in bear attacks in Alaska anyway are, are hunters. But when it comes right down to it, it they're really the, the, the greater group that actually encounters the bear are hikers, many of which are carrying guns. So I don't know that it matters why they're in the back country. It's what they're doing at the time they interact with the bear. And to the bear, I mean, these are important things. Let's say, you know, I'll throw this number out. Stephen Herrera, who's a, a colleague and friend who's uh, co-authored on uh, quite a few of these papers with me, neither he nor I, for all of North America, we don't have a single incident where two people calmly stood their ground and an angry bear touched them. Not once. And I'll have people say, oh, no, no, I, I remember, you know, in Alaska, the National Outdoor Leadership School had five, you know, kids in a group that all got attacked. Well, they were running like scared chickens. That's not, that's not a group of five. And so what happens is when you're hiking on a trail, let's say in Yellowstone, and my advice is in bear country, if you can have a conversation with somebody, that's about, the, that's about as far apart as you want to get. Otherwise, your group of, let's say, three good friends becomes three groups of one. And that lends itself to another insight, which is the vast majority of people involved in these bear attacks, this is continent-wide, are soloists, single people. And when it becomes a two people, the numbers are less than one would expect for their representation. So the point of all this is uh, probably the simplest thing you can do is when you need to is keep close to your hiking companions because just the presence of two or more people in and of itself, guns or no guns, bear spray or no bear spray, that's a deterrent. And I think it's just a, playing the odds. I think the animals are encouraged when it's a one-on-one scrap, but when it's two or more, they definitely back down. Yeah, back yeah. down. The reason I asked uh, the difference between uh, whether the data showed any difference between hikers and hunters is because Hunters many times will be um, trying to move quietly through the backcountry because they're stalking prey and looking for prey, and they don't want to scare it off. Whereas a hiker is just kind of enjoying the day. Yeah, no, that's right. So I think that uh, hunters are the single, like I said, the single largest 
a group of people involved. It's because they do everything, quote unquote, wrong in bear country. They're solo. They're camouflaged. They're trying not to and telegraph their presence to the surrounding country, which, which obviously, if you do that, then you're alerting bears. You're not going to surprise them. So, yeah, you're right. Uh, hunters do get involved disproportionately in these kind of, in these kind of uh, conflicts. And, and what you said about um, solo hikers and uh, increasing your your numbers by just one other hiker, um, well taken. Um, the, the last two maulings in Yellowstone that I recall, uh, one was a, a solo hiker who was going through uh, bear habitat, well-known bear habitat, up on Mary Mountain in Yellowstone. And uh, the uh, other mauling that comes to mind was a a couple that was walking out um, down a trail, and uh, I guess the husband tried to flee, and the the bear chased him down and, and killed him, leaving his spouse alone. So n- numbers definitely. Yeah, and that's that's interesting. You know, when I looked at about seven hundred incidents, I could query. I've done this. In fact, another effort I'm doing with uh, Kerry Gunter, who's the bear biologist for Yellowstone. Um, we're kind of we've taken a hard look. I've taken a hard look at the kind of messaging that's out there for be safe, you know, how to be safe in bear country. And quite a few of those as a bear biologist. Now I've been studying bears for about 27 years. I I raise my head up and go, what the, where did that come from? Why are people saying that? And so I've taken an approach where I've looked at it from the data. Okay. What happened when people ran from bears? You know, we tell them not to do it. That, that, that seems solid. And, And indeed, like you said, they, I think I had 61 cases where people's choice was, of all the things they could have done, they chose to run. And I think in 54 of them, the bear instantly uh, chased them down. And its response was to chase and take them out. So I think you don't need any uh, high-powered statistics to say that that's not a good thing to do. So I think it's important, like you say, to hike as a group, stay as a group. And But, but you know, I've done a lot of solo work myself. And there's things you can do to make that safe, too. But it does put you in a different category when it comes to one-on-one with a bear. You better be a little more prepared and much more aware than you would be otherwise. What would you recommend for going out solo hiking in bear habitat? Well, I think the simple thing, you know, one thing in looking at bear messaging over the years, one thing that I have not seen, although Yellowstone's really got on board, they have, is number one, you have no business, in my opinion, being off the road onto a trail if you don't have a way to deter a bear. So you need to have some way to do it. And as you probably read from one of my papers, from 71 cases of bear spray used in Alaska, it was uh, 98% effective. And I have a follow-up paper that we're doing on polar bears, and it's the same. It's 16 out of 17 cases the bear was turned. And in the one case with the polar bear, it was because of high wind you know, intercepted the spray and that, but, but the point is always carry deterrent. Um, the other one is if you're not going to have somebody with you, then you need to make noise. And I say make noise appropriately. You know, I've, I, I was in the back country of Katmai national park once and there's some guy down the meadow by himself and he was singing opera. And I thought, you know, I, <laughs> I want to go down and bear spray him. It was just <laughs> destroying just destroying the solitude. You know, we were watching a pack of wolves and all of a sudden their heads all turn and they ran. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it. I get it. But, you know, we, we do want to enjoy Yellowstone. We do want to enjoy these places. So when I say make noise appropriately, you don't have to be singing at the top of your lungs in a place that that you have good sight distance and, and you know, there's good visibility or if there's other people around. So, but as a soloist, I think you have to have that bear spray, have it ready and really have uh, pay a lot of attention and like i said make noise appropriately that's that's about all you can do really to give them a heads up that you're coming you know yeah yeah we're talking with dr tom smith a brigham young university professor who has studied uh guns in the backcountry and wildlife human conflicts uh, particularly involving all three species of north american bears we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. 
It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles from Key West, just very well might be the most remote national park in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, kayaking, and relaxing on pristine beaches. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. We're back with Dr. Tom Smith uh, discussing guns in the backcountry of national parks and how best you can prepare yourself uh, to be safe in bear habitat and whether guns are the logical choice. Dr. Smith, in your, your studies, it seems, um, obviously, a lot of your focus has been on um, brown bears, grizzly bears, polar bears. What about black bears? I mean, we've long heard that black bears are... Uh, the only time they're going to attack you is when they're hungry and you should definitely fight back. It's not so much you've spooked them and they're going to come attack you. Um, are we seeing more aggressive black bears these days? No, I, I think not. I think what we're seeing, and um, it's really strange, but it holds true across the continent and over in India as well, where I'm studying sloth bears over there. <clears throat> the more people there are in an area, the number of bear human conflicts tracks it perfectly. So it's not like bears are getting grouchy or less tolerant. There's just more people. And when we did the paper back in, oh gosh, what was it? 2011 or 2009? I can't remember on black bear inflicted fatalities in North America. One of those statistics was to show that that's exactly the case. Now, interestingly here in Utah, where I am now, quite a different mindset than Alaska. Here, the average person looks at black bears like a 300 pound chipmunk. Um, they don't seem to have a lot of healthy respect for them. And, you know, in 2007, uh, the first uh, black bear inflicted fatality occurred here. But the point about it is people will say, oh, these black bears, you know, they don't want anything to do with you, blah, blah, blah. You hear that a lot. Well, I don't really care about the ones that don't want anything to do with you, but I can promise you out of the three or 4,000 black bears in Utah and whatever there is in Colorado and Montana and as we go around states, there will be a few bears that you don't have to invoke. Uh, they're old, they're sick, they had a bad season of you know food, foraging, or anything. They're just predatory, and they, if they see a human and they think they can take the human, they will absolutely try to take the human. And so whenever you see a black bear, I treat them typically, you know, I leave them alone. I mean, if, if, if you know, who wants to just go around disturbing nature? So if I see a black bear on a hillside, I let it go. If it's on the trail ahead of me, I just climb up off the trail and let it pass. Generally, they're just trying to go somewhere. I've had plenty of interactions, but sometimes, you know, I'll be in a place where they wander out and they're coming obviously towards me. Treat them like a big dog, you know, and just kind of run at them aggressively, clap on my hands. But believe me, I got my bear spray on my side and 99% of the time they will turn and run. If they don't, now you got a problem and that's a bear you're going to have to deal with because that's not your normal behavioral profile. And if you have that kind of bear that's clearly not startled and it is not going to go away, <clears throat> you better have a deterrent because even a hundred pound bear could take a human down. And we've seen that in Alaska where big, strong men, you know, 200 pounds and just muscle and sinew got attacked by the one, a guy named Stephen Ralph, that was a 110 pound bear. He guessed when it stood, it was eye to eye to him. He said the first thing that entered his mind was he was totally shocked how strong that animal was, and he could not break its grip. And he said he, he guessed it weighed 110 pounds, and it was lucky that he's still alive. But the point is, that bear acted very unusual. He startled it in the brush. His first thought was, oh, thank goodness, it's just a black bear. Mm -hmm. Then it stopped for a second, it looked at him, and it lunged. And that is very unusual behavior. Now, that's just, I mean... It's just like humans. Most of us are pretty nice people, but, but there's those few, you know, on the fringe and we all stare, we all profile them. It's like, they're kind of not acting normal the way they look at you, the way they're moving. We do the same thing with these bears. If they don't run, they don't get out of there. If they're frontally, 
oriented and they start moving towards you, you better have a way to convince them to go somewhere else. So that's, yeah. that's the big difference. Yeah. No, I wanted to raise that question because of uh, uh, Shenandoah and Great Smoky Mountains National Parks. Um, obviously, a lot of black bears in both those parks. And uh, uh, last fall, I believe it was... Um, there was a, an incident between a, a bear and a, a ginseng hunter, and the, the, the question was whether the bear had killed the uh, ginseng poacher hunter or whether um, drugs had killed the hunter and the bear came upon him after the fact. I don't know if you've yeah, you know, heard that. And, and it's, it's kind of like that messy incident on the elk hunter with bear spray up in, um, you know, last fall there on the near the National Elk Refuge there in Jackson, Wyoming, you know, the bear spray naysayers and heaven only knows what their motivation is there. You'll, you'll see articles by them, you know, don't drop your guns, hang on to the bear spray. It's like, and then they'll put an article out there like, see, it failed this guy. And nobody knows what happened. He was by himself. He obviously tried to deploy his spray, you know, but we just don't know. And the other one that was interesting was the Todd Orr incident last year in Montana where the poor man got attacked twice. And he, you know, he put out a, you know, a spray, uh, uh, you know, big cloud of bear spray and the bear came at him. And, but then when you read the incident, I'm talking to him directly, but he was on the ground when the bear made contact. What the heck? You should never do that. If you have a can of spray, it sprays seven seconds. So, or five to seven, depending on the brand. But the point is you spray that stuff until that bears, you know, sucking on the end of your can and people go, I mean, I've worked a lot with this spray. It's just a physiological response, involuntary closure of the eyes, uh, constriction of the bronchioles. They can't breathe. Believe me, you get it in their face good enough. So what Orr did, in my opinion, he put out a burst and this grizzly was coming. He just laid down, fearing the imminent contact. Now, had he just stood up there and emptied the can, I think it would have come out differently, but we'll never know. So... Anyway, I guess I'm going off on a tangent, but I think that we, we never really know, as you're intimating there. Anyway, sometimes sometimes people just die and then bear scavenge, and then, you know, it's a it's a, considered a bear predatory attack when maybe it, it never was. But, but again, that's speculation. We don't know. Sure, sure. Have you um, um, seen any data or, or studied it yourself whether um, since um, National Park visitors were allowed to bring firearms into the parks, um, this goes back, I don't know, five or six, eight years ago um, since Congress allowed it, whether there has been an increase in incidents between uh, firearm carriers and, and bears or other wildlife? Well, I know, well, I remember when the when the rule first was put into place, there was, um, you know, I was working for the Park Service, and a woman in Glacier gunned down a deer because she said it was being aggressive. And then there was a number of other such things that happened where people felt threatened, but not with bears. I haven't seen a thing with bears. And I was talking to Terry Gunther up there in Yellowstone last fall, and they've not had a, a situation where somebody defended themselves against the bear with a gun in the park. But what's ironic, you can go into Yosemite and uh, you can have, you know, a gun on each hip and walk around. That's legal, but you can't carry bear spray. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. That is that is an odd regulation that the park has there. Talking about bear spray, I mean, um, you go into a store and it's going to cost 40 or $45. And, and some people might say, well, gosh, that's an awful lot of money to spend for an afternoon hike in the park or a three-day backpack uh, trip in a park. How long um, does bear spray last? I mean, I, I know I've got a couple cans here, and uh, I don't I haven't checked the expiration date, but we're going up to Yellowstone this summer, and I'm sure other people have the same question. You know, does the expiration date on a can hard and fast, or, or any any thoughts on that? Yeah, so we did that. We looked at that for polar bears. Well, actually, I looked at it. I I got several hundred cans from the Forest Service cans that had never been fired, and uh, they never been fired. We weighed them all, and then we plotted their weight against their age. And what you could see was there was a 1% to 2% reduction in weight per year on these cans. And so in talking to the bear spray company, I said, what, what is going on there? And I talked to um, a fellow there from Counter Assault, 
And he said, well, we've, we, we have uh, got the, in fact, my number was exactly the same as yours. It was theirs. It was 1.9% per year loss. He said, because the propellant, which was C-134A, it's been changed now by counter but the propellant, he said, is a kind of a sneaky molecule when it gets around the seal, just the propellant, not the, not the hot stuff. So the propellant can go down. Now, the active ingredient, oleoresin capsaicin, uh, capsicum, I'm sorry, which contains capsaicin, which is the active ingredient, uh, they don't degrade over time. I was told that very clearly. So a 20-year-old can still, given that it's never been fired and it's got, uh, you know, it's, it's still pretty heavy, um, that's going to fire just fine. So <clears throat> anyway, I think it's an issue you can imagine in this world, uh, litigious world, they put a four-year expiration on it, but at year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, it's still good. And I know the companies aren't going to tell you that, you know, and, and I understand that it's, uh, but, but I, the truth is it's just propellant that's going down. Now, if you sat a can on a counter and you just slapped it or kind of bounced your fist off the trigger and it did one half, you know, quarter of a second burst, kind of a like that, that's mm-hmm. the same amount of propellant that's gone in 10 years. So it's not much. And so um, I think between me and you, um, you know, I I have two things. One, I wouldn't toss it on the expiration date myself uh, just because of that. But on the other hand, you know, let's not be too cheap about how important it is to protect ourselves from bears. Um, So there's kind of a balance there, right? Sure, sure. And um, as you mentioned, with uh, guns, you have to know how to use them and fire them and, and get ready. You have to know how to use bear spray. It's not a uh, panacea that you can just go out there. You have to uh, pay attention to which way the wind is blowing and uh, the bear charge distance and that sort of thing. Well, you know, we did we did computer modeling and we actually did modeling uh, actual field tests with these things. One of the one of the reasons we looked at this was bear spray is not a commonly used and commonly relied upon deterrent for bears in the Arctic. So seeing some high profile deaths last summer, you might recall two men were killed by bears. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were defenseless, didn't have any way to deal with bears. It's really sad stories. The one they were out egg gathering and the the man sent his kids away as he stood between them and the bear and the, you know, polar bear just took him out, you know? So I think that that's really sad because in my opinion, just a $40 can of bear spray, he'd still be around. And so we wanted to look at the three reasons why Northern peoples object to it. And I'll just make it very short here. One is some people believe that there's nothing you're putting into a, uh, you know, a, a thin canister like that, that's going to stop a thousand pound aggressive determined bear. Number two, the wind will disable it. Number three, the cold renders it useless. So I've run studies on all that. And uh, basically we have a paper coming out that, that is to encourage them that, you know, even at 40 below zero, the spray will go uh, four meters. Um, it doesn't atomize well, but you paint their face and you will stop them. And so, uh, and same with the wind. Um, it comes out of the can about 70 miles an hour. And sure, when you get a, here, here's the thing about wind. It, there's a 50-50 chance, right? It can be in your face or from behind mm-hmm. or or from the, from the side. So it's not always, yeah, I mean, I mean, it, it, the odds aren't always against you. Sometimes it can help, but but the other thing is, it's got such a strong push. It, it very rarely, I mean, if nothing else, when the bear gets close enough, you will be dumping it onto their face, and they will get burned. And somebody said, "Well, that's I don't want to do that." Well, I mean, that beats the alternative, right? Which is doing <laughs> nothing. And Absolutely. and uh, and that's an interesting other little statistic we found is that. In 90% of instances where a person was down and, the, and another person came to the rescue and sprayed the bear in the face, it stopped the mauling. Now, the kind of low-voiced other 10% was they got mauled themselves, which is not unfortunate. But, it, but, it, but my point is at close range, spraying a bear, it's a problem. So it's not what you and I want to do, but we've seen plenty of times at close range, it, it will get them. So, you know, I think that I don't, I can't even remember your original question. <laughs> I've gone down a, a path here, but I think it's all relevant that, that, that the spray is very effective and 
and oh, it was about the wind, and the wind does have an effect. But one other thing I will say, I get a little frustrated with people who overburden the public with, oh, make sure you know you 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 know you carry the bear spray in a certain place, which I think is fine. That it can't be in a pack. But mm-hmm. then they say, you know, hold it at arm's length, cock it slightly down, blah blah blah. You know, I I, I get all that, but you you give people too much stuff, and it just they just kind of melt down under pressure. So I think it's important just point it and spray it, you know, at a distance. It's good out about 20, 25 feet when the bear crosses that line, start spraying them, you know, and, and uh, don't get too hung up on all that other stuff. I just, and, and, and I hear people say, make sure the wind's in, in your favor. Are you kidding me? What? You're going to put your finger in the air and then tell the bear to stop for a second while you reposition. Come on. That's that's nonsense. People don't have time to do that. You're going to spray the bear. You're not going to. Now, if it's a slowly unfolding thing, maybe you could massage the circumstance. But generally, that I, I file that under uh, well-intentioned but meaningless, useless information. Right, right. No, it sounds like bear spray is a lot more effective than a gun. Well, I mean, again, it depends on you. Let's say you're a SEAL team guy and <laughs> or whatever. And you're, you're trained for combat. I mean, I think guns are good, but you got to realize for the average person, that kind of quick deployment, accurate shooting and all that stuff. I mean, that's difficult. And not to mention the fact that wounding a bear is not a good thing. Now, one statistic that if you noticed in the paper I sent you, if you just looked at all these people carrying guns, there was 444 people involved. Half of those people, so they all had guns, half of them never got to pull the gun out and use it for a whole lot of reasons. The gun was never used. Now, some have said, well, that's not fair I used to include those. Well, yeah, it is fair because the gun as a deterrent in of itself is kind of a pain, right? Let's sure. say you hike into some backcountry area. You're not going to be walking around your campsite with a gun while you're pitching a tent and cooking dinner. You will with bear spray on your hip, and there's been a few people that – looked up and there's a bear right there that's wandered into their campsite and the guns, you know, somewhere else. So my point being though, when you looked at the injury statistics for those people who did not use the gun versus those who did, there was no statistical difference between the two groups. So we could talk about that for a half hour, what that means, but I'm not seeing guns. The, the big issue here is we're talking statistics. We're pooling it together On an individual basis, it's very important that you look at your abilities, and if you're competent, then a gun may be a good thing for you. But why not carry bear spray as well? Because there's times when, you know, your firearm's not handy or you don't want to hike with it in your arms, you know, in your hands and all that stuff. There's no reason. I mean, it's not an either-or thing. You could carry both if, if, if that's what you want to do. One other thing I have to throw in there, if I might, sure is... We had a number of instances, which, oh my goodness, I I never even thought about this. It was people who, when push came to shove, they couldn't bring themselves to shoot a living animal. I mean, admittedly, it's a bear and their life's threatened. They couldn't do it. And the bears just took them out or they took their friends out. That was another one on a government, uh, uh, a couple, couple of these in Alaska. I interviewed the people where, you know, they're USGS, they're out doing geological stuff. And somebody carried the gun. Well, it turns out in this one case, the gun bearer was a person that objected to injuring anything. And they find that out when the bears are, he goes, oh, I can't shoot a bear. (laughs) He's got the gun. So they said, well, shoot warning shots. So he blam, blam, blam. And the bear didn't do anything, which in 30, uh, let's see, 70% of the cases, the bears don't do anything with the warning shot. So now he was down to one bullet left. That's all he had. And they go, how many... Reload the gun. He goes, well, I only brought four shells (laughs) because they didn't expect to have a problem. So he shot three in the ground. Long story short, he still wouldn't shoot until he was on top of this colleague of mine mauling her. He angled in and took the bear's head off from the side. It was a 30 odd six. I mean, geez. And, and so it's, that's another problem is people don't want to squeeze that trigger because they don't want to kill the animal. Part of the reason too, in places all throughout the North America if you kill that thing, you're going to have to skin it. You're going to have to turn in the hide, the skull, and the claws. Who wants to do that? Also, you're going to be moron of the week, 
in the newspaper, oh, you know, idiot shot this bear, you know, killed this bear. So people don't want to do it. And that reluctance to deploy the deterrent, that gives the bear a definite advantage. I saw that in a lot of places. Now, there's a lot of people, me included. My mind's made up. If a bear crosses a certain line, it's getting some sort of deterrent. Sure. But I've done, I've done hundreds of times with big, big brown bears up there in Cap. I mean, you know, thousand pound bears. And so I'm pretty comfortable with that. But your average person, I don't know. I, I think that's a really dice. So you factor in all that stuff. I can see why guns haven't had as good of overall success as bear spray. You know, with a non-lethal, you got a bear wandering your way. You're not killing it. You're just saying, hey, get out of here. Right. Spray that thing. I mean, you know, you're not going to kill it. It's going to be incapacitated for a few minutes. But that's way different judgment than pulling the trigger. I didn't realize that um, if you killed a, a, a grizzly bear or, or maybe even a black bear that you had to skin it and pack out the hide, the skull, and the claws. Is that um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife regulation? That's Alaska, and that's the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Here in Utah, I don't know what they do if you shot a bear. I don't know that they require you to do that, but in Alaska, they do. So that, that when I've, you know, I digress a little bit there, that Alaska is where I've done most of my work. But, but here's the key thing. The bears in Alaska, I don't think, are one whit different than the bears down here. Sure. So it's not like, you know, we have seven confirmed black bear inflicted fatalities in Alaska and only one in Utah. Well, but look at the number. We got, what, three or 4,000 bears here? Up there, they've got like 130,000, 140,000. They don't know. So it's just a numbers game. But so I, I guess what I'm saying is up there, there's a lot more bear human conflict because there's a lot more bears and they just, they're trying to make people think twice where they just blow bears away. We, we'd have to look at that and see what the deal is here. If you shot when you yell, I'm sure they're not going to make you do it. But up there, that's another reason why people are very reluctant to kill a bear. Now, I noticed that you've also done um, some research with mountain sheep or mountain goats. Uh, I would assume that uh, bear spray works on them too. As you, you might recall, a few years back, there was a, a sad situation in Olympic National Park where a, a big uh, mountain goat killed a hiker. Would bear spray have worked there? Oh, yeah. It, it works on all these guys. It works on everybody. In fact, my daughters all have a can they set by their nightstand. So if somebody comes in the house at night, they can spray them. And, you know, and, and why? Well, how many times have we heard of people shooting their own family members that come in late, you know, and stuff, but you spray them. They're going to be screaming, but at least they're not dead. Yeah. And uh, so it works on mammals very well. We've yeah. sprayed birds, too. It works on them. <laughs> <laughs> can't remember any attacks fatal attacks by uh hawks or uh no but sometimes you want to get them out of your <laughs> sure <laughs> out of your chicken coop <laughs> raptors yeah. but but the thing is yeah it works on those and moose definitely works on them i've had uh friends that have sprayed moose and it, you know where they were doing you know racing around a tree and the moose is trying to stomp them this is up in alaska and they let them get a face full of bear spray and down here same with cougars um Dr. David Madsen, formerly a Yellowstone biologist that worked with cougars here in on the Colorado Plateau, he he um, recommended bear spray as well for uh, mountain lions. Although they're kind of a you know ambush predator, so you don't have much time to see them coming. I suspect. Sure, sure. That's good to know. We've been talking today with Dr. Tom Smith, a Brigham Young University professor who long has studied uh, wildlife and human conflicts in the backcountry uh, involving all three species of North American bears. Tom, I appreciate you joining us today, and um, let's be safe out there this summer. Yeah, you bet. My pleasure. Thank you, Kurt. RV Share provides not only an option for renters to enjoy the perks of RV travel without having to buy one, but an opportunity for owners to earn income by renting theirs out. You'll find everything from large and luxurious Class A RVs all the way to small and easy to tow pop-up campers. You can even use their filters to find an RV that is dog friendly or one that will be delivered right to your campground. Visit RVShare.com to start your search for the perfect RV rental or to list your RV. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. 
Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Washington State tends to lure visitors interested in volcanic features, but the two states immediately to the south shouldn't be overlooked. Lassen Volcanic National Park in California and Crater Lake National Park in Oregon both have eruptive pasts, the remains of which are readily apparent. Today, these two national parks are showcases for the Earth's fiery fury. Both are located along the Volcanic Legacy Scenic Byway, which runs 500 miles. Lassen anchors the southern end in California and Crater Lake, the northern terminus in Oregon. Start your drive at Crater Lake and you will see one of the most beautiful sights in the country. This blue jewel is cradled in the crater left by the eruption of prehistoric Mount Mazama. This magma chamber erupted over two days. The mountain then collapsed, and the resulting crater filled with azure-hued water to a depth of almost 2,000 feet. Don't just roam the rim and gaze at the water, though. A visit to Crater Lake should include a boat trip on the lake as well. The half-day cruise includes a stop at Wizard Island, a volcanic crater inside the larger crater, and a slow circumnavigation of Phantom Ship, a volcanic feature. Stay at Crater Lake Lodge up on the rim or down in Mazama Village and spend a few days exploring the park's primeval forests. A nice easy hike is the Castle Crest Wildflower Trail. Located less than a quarter mile from the start of the East Rim Drive across from park headquarters, this half-mile loop trail takes you through meadows bursting with wildflowers. They say there's more than 200 species growing here. There's also a small gurgling creek that you'll pass and rimming forests of mountain hemlock, lodgepole pine, subalpine fir, and Shasta red fir. The trail was built as a Boy Scout project back in 1929. Less than 225 miles to the south of Crater Lake, via US 97 and California 89, Lassen Volcanic National Park is another, more recent geologic wonder. It's a surprisingly and wonderfully uncrowded park wrapped around a peak that unleashed its volcanic fury a number of times from 1914 to 1917. The most violent of the blasts, on May 22, 1915, sent a superheated pyroclastic flow down the peak and created today's devastated area. There's a trail through the devastated area that could better be called a geologic trail. It roams only about a half mile, but within that half mile, you're presented with the aftermath of the volcanic eruptions. There was one on May 19th of 1915 and two on May 22nd that year. They rained down rocks and boulders, mud and hot gases, a pyroclastic flow more than two miles from the peak. Photos taken by B.F. Loomis show the route the majority of the largest blast took on May 22nd, clearing a wide path through forests. At the time, U.S. Forest Service officials estimated that the eruption knocked down 5 million board feet of timber. While Lassen Peak is the main attraction in the park, it is just one of four volcanoes to be found here. Lassen Peak is a plug dome volcano, one created by lava pressure around a vent, but there also are examples of shield, composite, and cinder cone volcanoes within the park's boundaries. Lodging at Lassen consists of some Spartan rental cabins, along with some campgrounds. For an added bonus, stop by Lava Beds National Monument, conveniently located halfway between Crater Lake and Lassen Volcanic, and explore the monument's underbelly by touring some of its caves. Sign up for the Fern Cave Tour and see ancient pictographs that trace the cultural history of the area back thousands of years. Those are the main attractions along the volcanic legacy scenic byway, a west coast highway that links two incredible national parks with volcanic pasts. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. 
As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Yosemite Conservancy inspires people to support projects and programs that preserve Yosemite National Park and enrich the visitor experience. The Conservancy funds transformative work throughout the park. The grant's donors' support help protect diverse wildlife and plant species and restore the precious habitats they depend on. Grants also support improvements to miles of trails to ensure visitors can safely access Yosemite's wonders. Visit yosemiteconservancy.org to find more inspiration. Now a commentary. There's a new book dealing with the national parks out called National Parks, Our Living Treasure, A Time for Concern. As you might infer from the title, it's not a book about what to see or do in the national park system, but rather one that tries to bring concern to the plight of the parks. The book is the work of Dr. Gil Lusk, who put in more than three decades with the National Park Service, a career that included stints as park superintendent at places such as Glacier National Park in Montana and Big Bend National Park in Texas. As soon as we receive a copy of the book, we'll provide a more formal review on The Traveler. But in an op-ed column, Lusk titled, The Future or Extinction of the National Park System, he makes the case that there are too many national parks in the system for too few dollars in staff for the National Park Service to take care of. Congress and executive branches over the past 30 years have allowed necessary repairs and upkeep of our treasures to go largely unfunded with a current documented backlog of some $12 billion, six times the annual budget for the agency, writes Lusk. The only thing being done is adding more parks to the system. We need to close some parks, shifting funds and staff to the parks that are most in need of rehabilitation and restoration. So insufficient is the size of the official National Park Service workforce that the agency requires another 220,000 volunteers to make ends meet, he points out. And then, while volunteers can help in some areas, they are no use for dealing with the park system's roughly $12 billion maintenance backlog. This is not a new shot across the bow of Congress and the National Park Service. Back in 1955, Wallace Stegner, one of the deans of conservation writing, wrote an essay titled, We Are Destroying Our National Parks, for none other than Sports Illustrated. Stegner wrote of the overcrowding of parks, of Americans' penchant for littering and defacing public property, and of the threat that commercialization held like a knife at the neck of our national park system. A national park is not a playground and not a resort, though it may be ideal for such activities as hiking, riding, climbing, hunting with a camera, fishing, and cross-country skiing, sports which demand no installations, attract no spectators, and leave no scars, wrote Stegner. The real purpose of the national parks, to preserve scenery, beauty, geology, archaeology, wildlife, for permanent use in living natural museums, is not affected by these but it cannot be made compatible with weekend dances, ski tournaments, speedboat races, and a million people a year. Stegner was not the first to sound the alarm about the damage being done to national parks either. Two years earlier, in 1953, Bernard DeVoto wrote in Harper's Magazine that the parks must be closed. The national park system must be temporarily reduced to a size for which Congress is willing to pay. Let us, as a beginning, Close Yellowstone, Yosemite, Rocky Mountain, and Grand Canyon National Parks, wrote DeVoto. Close and seal them, assign the Army to patrol them, and so hold them secure till they can be reopened. They have the largest staffs in the system, but neither those staffs nor the budgets allotted them are large enough to maintain the areas at a proper level of safety, attractiveness, comfort, or efficiency. They are unable to do the job in full, and so it had better not be attempted at all. And now Lusk has added his voice to the call. The future of the National Park Service hangs on decisions badly needed, but not being made. A review of the past 103 years is needed, he writes. Why have parks gotten to this place of concern they are now in? 
vulnerable treasures subject to misuse, poor funding, failing infrastructure, and complete lack of proper proactive planning to correct the present situation and prevent future deterioration of the treasures managed. As we at Traveler have suggested, Lusk says there's a need for an apolitical commission to, as he put it, evaluate and review the current situation and propose needed actions to cure the present and preserve the future based on the National Park Service mission. One task as a necessary holding action while the commission works is to rank every national park site in terms of its national significance, endangerment, and use. Areas below a certain level would be placed in caretaker status, with most of their funds and staff reassigned to parks with significant problems and needs. Lusk makes other suggestions for this commission, and you can find his op-ed on nationalparkstraveler.org. Hopefully, his words won't be received by deaf ears in Congress. There have been too many calls over the decades for the issues confronting the national parks and the National Park Service to continue to be kicked down the road by an unresponsive and apparently uncaring Congress. That's our show for this week. We hope you found it interesting. For National Parks Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Parks Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.